So welcome to this week's installment of Rapid Response History, um, put together by the History Department at the University of Iowa with the generous hosting of the Iowa City Public Library. Um, I'm Lisa Heineman from the History Department, and our guest today is Jim Giblin, who is also a professor in the History Department, specialist in African history. And um, I'd like to start out, as we usually do, by introducing Professor Giblin with a, a brief interview. So. Please step forward, join us. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to ask you is here you are a specialist in African history. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in the connections between your area of specialty and issues of environment in particular. Oh my, oh my, it's so long ago now. Um, well, the, 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 the quick answer is that uh, way back when I was in graduate school, this is going back to the late 1970s, uh, there was an emerging interest among historians of Africa in environmental change. You know, historians sort of were giving up on the old idea that the environment was sort of an unchanging backdrop um, in front of which people engaged in, his, in history. Um, and uh, so I, I was caught up in this. I was very intrigued, intrigued by these ideas of uh, uh, environmental change. And then, uh, you know, be began to do uh, research that involved uh, interaction between uh, environment and uh, uh, societies in East Africa, particularly in uh, Tanzania. So that's okay. the short story. That's the uh, short story. Uh -huh. Okay, someday I'll ask you the long one. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to hear specifically about elephant genocide in human history in East Africa. Right. We see a kind of a specific case study you'll all remember from Professor Yale's discussion of, um, of charismatic um, animals that are in danger, right? And this is, is an excellent example of that. Um, some of you might find today's lecture particularly interesting, and if that's the case, I wondered if we could just ask a little bit about what kinds of courses you teach in case anyone would like to sign up for more. Yeah, sure. Uh, I teach... Uh uh, survey courses uh, on, on African history. They provide a uh, they provide coverage of uh, all of uh, of Africa. Although uh, oftentimes uh, hum, I, I don't have time to say more than uh, a little bit about uh, uh, particular places in what is an immense uh, continent. Uh, so I teach uh, courses on different periods of African history, and uh, in those courses I deal with different themes, uh, uh, social change, cultural change, uh, political events, and so forth. And uh, in addition, I teach for the um, International Studies BA program. I teach a course every year on health and disease in Africa, and it, uh, that is another course that has an uh, environmental component as well. Yeah. Terrific. So as you all are looking for courses to follow up, please look for Professor mm -hmm. Giblin's um, really excellent courses. And um, students who have worked with him can vouch for the fact that he's just a terrific teacher, a terrific mentor, um, and somebody well worth getting to know better. So let me hand things over to you okay. for today's lecture. And of all course, right. we'll follow it with a Q&A afterwards. OK, thank you very much. And let me, let me begin by, by thanking uh, Professor Heinemann for inviting me to uh, uh, participate in this uh, uh, course. I'm, I'm really delighted to see all of you, too. I'm sure that uh, when uh, you signed up for this course, you weren't thinking that there would be a beautiful spring evening like this when you'd have to stay indoors. So I'll try to make it as, uh, uh, as pleasant as possible, even though you may feel somewhat uh, imprisoned. Um, so uh, as I was uh, saying, uh, way back when I was in graduate school, I got interested in uh, issues that had to do with the African uh, environment. I think I was most interested in what we would now think of as uh, 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 ecology. That is to say, thinking about environment as a web of, of interconnected relationships among uh, various uh, forces, uh, whether they be a geological or uh, uh, plant species, animal species, and so forth. And I was very interested in understanding how uh, human societies interact with um, uh, all of these uh, environmental or ecological relationships. Okay? Uh, I've 
do need to give you a disclaimer at the outset, though. I don't consider myself an expert on, as a historian of the environment. Okay? Uh, I have written about the uh, environmental change in East Africa, but compared to uh, Professor Priest, for example, who you'll, you'll meet next week, or some of the other speakers who you've already uh, encountered, uh, I can't claim to have that kind of uh, uh, expertise. But uh, nevertheless, I am very interested in uh, the way in which uh, African people interact with uh, the, the forces and the entities that they find in their natural environment. So here we are. Uh, here's the African continent. I'll begin by pointing out that uh, I'm going to uh, 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 talk uh, quite a bit this evening about uh, Tanzania in East Africa. This is where I've done most of my uh, own research over the years. Uh, really more than uh, 30 years now. And um, uh, I guess I would begin by uh, saying that uh, I'm going to be talking, as Professor uh, Heinemann uh, mentioned, about uh, uh, elephants in part, although I'm not going to get deep into the history of, of uh, uh, elephants. There is a very complex and very old history, both of elephants in the African continent and of interaction between uh, elephants and uh, humans. Okay, uh, for just to give you a kind of a sense of this, the depth of this history. Okay, if we look at the uh, history of the Sahara region, that is the Great Sahara Desert, that is the the brown area to the top of the uh, continent. There, this is the most arid part of the uh, world. Okay. We know that uh, uh, long ago, uh, going back maybe 10,000 years, uh, this region was much uh, uh, less arid than it is today. It supported human populations and the populations of many wildlife species as well, including elephants. Okay. About 7,000 years ago, the Sahara region began to dry up. Okay, uh, gradually uh, moving uh, towards the kind of hyperarid conditions that exist in that part of the African continent uh, today. As the uh, Sahara went through this process of desiccation, as the specialists say, uh, uh, the living uh, beings, living uh, uh, populations of, of the uh, continent, uh, of the desert, we began to migrate away to uh, areas that were more hospitable. Both humans and wildlife species moved to the north to occupy areas very close to the Mediterranean coast. And uh, uh, elephants were, in fact, one of the uh, species that migrated northwards uh, to, uh, to the Mediterranean. At the same time, other uh, populations, both human and wildlife, migrated to the south into what we think of today as West Africa, the area south of the uh, Sahara. So what you get then, about starting about 7,000 years ago, is a division, a splitting up of elephant populations into those that uh, became part of the Mediterranean world and those that became part of the uh, African continent south of the Sahara. Of course, those Mediterranean elephants are the very uh, elephants that uh, are, uh, are relied upon by uh, Hannibal. You've all heard about Hannibal and his unsuccessful attempt to conquer Rome by uh, taking uh, uh, forces on, uh, or forces with elephants across the Alps and so forth. Uh, uh, this is one of the most famous examples uh, of uh, human elephant interaction in the ancient world. And meanwhile, in the southern half of the African continent, elephants became distributed over a very uh, wide uh, area. Okay? And uh, here we have a map uh, indicating uh, something about population distribution. Uh, the uh, what purplish color represents the densest or the denser populations of elephants. You see that uh, uh, the biggest elephant populations today exist in East Africa, including Tanzania, and then in this belt down through uh, southern Africa, right down to the uh, southern tip of the African continent. But uh, in addition, elephants are distributed more widely uh, as well throughout what we often call sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa south of the, um, south of the Sahara. So here's some pictures of elephants. I'm actually not going to show, show you as many pictures of elephants as perhaps you hoped for. Okay? But I do have a point or two to make about elephants. 
Professor, yes, <laughs> they are. Professor uh, Heinemann mentioned, uh, uh, described them as charismatic. They are charismatic. They are really amazing. Okay? Uh, if you see elephants in the wild, it is the kind of thing that really stops you in your tracks. Or if you're driving somewhere and you see one uh, from, from the highway, you can't help but pull over and, and stare at these really magnificent, magnificent beasts. They stand out by virtue, of course, of their size. They're huge. Uh, but also by virtue of their, if you will, their mannerisms. They just look very dignified. I, I, you know, it's hard to uh, put it any other way. Uh, they look like they really belong. They look like really grounded sort of, uh, of beings and so forth. Um, and um, uh, in fact, one of, it's, this kind of, it's these kind of characteristics of elephants that have led countless people to read into them various kinds of human uh, qualities. Okay? So elephants are, uh, or you all know, you've all heard that elephants never forget. right? Um, oftentimes, uh, 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 elephants, if, actually, if I go back for a second, okay, but, uh, when people look at uh, uh, groups of elephants, uh, the the, by virtue of the fact that they are what's called difo uh, diformic, that is to say, uh, the uh, males are larger than females, and then you have smaller uh, uh, children elephants and so forth. The way that they array themselves in a, in a line with the largest males leading the way, and then the uh, slightly smaller females, and then the children, well, you can't escape likening them to human families. And people have been uh, doing this for a very long time. And indeed, they are very sociable um, animals. Okay. Um, here's an obituary from the New York Times only last week. This woman, uh, Daph uh, Daphne Sheldrick, a very well-known uh, elephant uh, con uh, conservationist, uh, died very recently. Uh, there was a, quite an interesting uh, obituary in the newspaper. You see this wonderful uh, photograph from 1968 of uh, Daphne and her own uh, daughter. And, but notice the uh, quote here from the obituary. Uh, uh, Ms. Sheldrick quoted as saying that tremendous capacity for caring is, I think, perhaps the most amazing thing about them, she said. Okay? They have all the best attributes of us humans and not very many of the bad. Simply one example from a, a very recent newspaper of the kind of thing that people just um, can't, help but, can't help themselves but say about uh, elephants. They are really amazing. And it's not just white people who go to Africa and say these things. African people themselves uh, say many of the same things. They are as very, they are every bit as much impressed by elephants as uh, European or American uh, tourists. Indeed, uh, oftentimes people in Tanzania will say that elephants are possessed. They are inhabited by spirits of human ancestors. Okay, and say again. You wouldn't be surprised, fair enough. You'd, be, <laughs> you'd find a lot of people who would agree with you. And this kind of uh, builds in an attitude of you know, respect for these animals and I think at, at, you know, a, a real sense of, of uh, empathy with, with them. I, wouldn't, you know, I would go as far, far as uh, uh, that. So these are uh, extraordinary animals. Okay? Well, but now the recent story is uh, a very disturbing one. Okay? In recent years, uh, uh, East Africa and indeed the whole belt of Eastern and Southern Africa that was in the uh, blue on the map has uh, witnessed an increase in uh, poaching of elephants, uh, these elephants being killed for their ivory, for their tusks. The tusks then sold to uh, uh, various destinations abroad, but particularly to uh, Asia. Uh, most people who have studied this trade believe that uh, China is the primary market for um, elephants. And indeed, the uh, scale of mortality is so great okay, that a number of observers have begun to liken this uh, killing off of elephants to uh, genocide, to the mass killing of human uh, populations. This is taking place in Tanzania as as it is in other nations in the region. And in Tanzania, this is despite the fact that um, Tanzania, uh, th that at least 20% of uh, Tanzania is uh, devoted to uh, protected wildlife reserves. But nevertheless, poachers penetrate into these 
uh, protected area. This is the largest of all of the Tanzania wildlife preserves, the famous Celis Reserve. Okay? It's about the size of Switzerland, so it's a very, very large area. Okay? And yet uh, within, and perhaps because it's, it's, it's so large and so difficult to monitor and the police, uh, poachers are quite active in that area. I might point out though, okay, when you look at this map, you begin to get a sense for the price that some African countries pay in order to participate in wildlife conservation. Okay? Think for a second about the recent controversies in our own country, in the American West, about the extent of government control of Western lands. Right? We've seen a lot of controversy over that in recent years, and there are plenty of people in the West who will say that the government shouldn't try to hold on, shouldn't try to preserve so much land that they should make it, they should open it up for private use. And in fact, the same kind of debate has developed in Tanzania. Tanzania really does uh, pay a price for the fact that it has maintained all of these reserves. For example, the Celis Reserve actually has the effect of isolating this region of the country here from the Indian Ocean coast. And it just kind of messes up the, the region's uh, uh, transport and communications infrastructure and forces, uh, it forces people to make long, circuitous trips if they want to go to that uh, southern part of the uh, country. Okay? Well, here, here we have uh, an example of a recent uh, academic publication on this theme, uh, making connection between uh, ivory uh, smuggling and uh, increasing mortality in elephants. Okay? And likewise, yeah, this really is horrible, it's true. But this is the kind of, this is what, what you get. Uh, and uh, uh, so you get uh, uh, a number of NGOs and private organizations uh, of activists and so forth trying to pu uh, bring publicity to uh, this situation. Okay? Uh, this is a, uh, a problem, an event that's in the news all the time. These are clippings that I took out of the New York Times. It's just since I began to think about what I was going to say at this lecture. On the one hand, a story about how the United States government has recently lifted a ban on uh, the importation of ivory trophies into the United States, uh, a move which uh, many people feel will only encourage uh, trophy hunting okay? and you know, increase the market for uh, ivory. And on the other side, uh, Britain has recently uh, uh, banned the sale of all kinds of ivory objects, even uh, older artworks and so forth, actually sending uh, some uh, uh, markets in, in uh, artwork into a kind of a, a tizzy. So this is something that's very much in the, the news. Okay? Here we have an estimate of the size, if you will, of the poaching problem, uh, estimates of the number of elephants poached in recent years. And we can see uh, uh, information in this map about uh, the uh, shrinking range of elephants as well. Okay? And uh, this, uh, uh, illust this illustrates the uh, uh, both the scale and the direction of the trade in smuggled ivory. Notice the Tanzania thought to be the largest supplier of uh, ivory to international traders. China assumed to be the largest uh, importer, the largest consumer of smuggled um, ivory. And nevertheless, okay, despite you know, what appear to be very impressive estimates of uh, the uh, uh, mortality and, and the scale of uh, elephant uh, uh, smuggling and so forth. Uh, uh, nevertheless, pop the population history, or if you will, the demographic history of elephants okay, is very much understudied. We know rather little about it. We have a great many estimates about, for example, about the scale of recent mortality of elephants. But the truth of the matter is, we really don't know very much about the basic facts of the population, the history of the population of African elephants. Okay? We don't know for any 
particular point in time, how many elephants existed in Africa uh, in the past. We don't know with any kind of precision what the range of elephants was in the past, the, you know, the areas that uh, elephants actually inhabited. Okay? Um, we don't know uh, also uh, how quickly elephant populations can recover from uh, periods of uh, exceptionally heavy mortality. Okay? So we really have very little historical knowledge to inform our sense of whether or not this recent period of elephant killing is really going to lead to the extinction of elephants, as, as some observers believe may be the case, or whether it's possible uh, that if um, uh, the scale of, of killing slows, that uh, uh, elephant populations may be able to uh, recover. We simply don't know uh, very much about many of these um, issues. But there are a couple of things that we can say about elephant population history with a, a, a real degree of certainty. Okay? And the first thing that I want to point out here is that uh, we can identify distinct episode, episodes of what you might consider to be a periods of, of, of elephant genocide. Okay? Uh, roughly since the, sometime in the 1980s up to the present, we've been witnessing uh, a period of a very heavy elephant mortality that you can probably liken to uh, a, a, a genocide. Okay? Likewise, in an earlier period, from about 1870 to 1920, okay, Africa went through an earlier period that we can, with equal justice, consider to be a time of elephant genocide. During that 50-year period, okay, elephants were killed in very, very large numbers, especially in Eastern Africa, for their ivory. Okay? Ivory used for, for example, for piano keys or for making the handles of things like umbrellas. Or, as the Illinois Billiard Association pointed out, you see, in the 1920s, uh, making billiard balls. Okay? 4,000 elephants a year, they estimated, were uh, killed in order to uh, uh, provide billiard balls in the 1920s. Okay? Uh, Esmond Martin, a, an American and, a, and an authority who lived on ivory trading, who lived for many years in Kenya, uh, has estimated that during this period, okay, uh, perhaps 44,000 elephants were being killed annually, okay, at least during the period of peak um, uh, uh, mortality, although it has to be said that uh, uh, you know, these estimates all have to be handled with care. Uh, uh, there's, there's relatively little uh, solid information. It's also interesting that Esmond Martin was uh, recently um, uh, murdered in Kenya uh, under circumstances that have never been explained. This is only a few, couple of months ago this happened. Sorry? I'm sorry, I yeah. hope he died. Yeah? I hope he died. Oh, well, he was on the side of the elephants. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough. <clears throat> oh, in fact, here he is. Okay, um, no suspects in killing of, a, of an eccentric American. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis in the New York Times on his eccentricity, but in fact, uh, uh, he played a very important part in publicizing the scale of elephant, recent elephant mortality and the history of elephant genocide in, uh, in Africa. And one wonders if that had something to do with his uh, murder. Okay. Here's the second point that I can make with some certainty about elephant population history. Okay. During these periods of elephant genocide, okay, outsiders, non-Africans, people coming into Africa from other parts of the world have played a crucial role, both as participants, primarily as traders, and also as um, uh, people, uh, also uh, foreign countries acting as markets, providing demand for uh, ivory. Okay. Here is the 19th century trade uh, in ivory at Zanzibar. Zanzibar is today a part of uh, Tanzania. It was then, as it is now, a major port. And notice, what I want you to notice are the white people, the Europeans who are overseeing uh, whatever's being done with the piling up of the <coughs> ivory and so forth. And, and more recently, the famous Chinese queen of ivory, arrested by the Tanzanian police in, in uh, 2015, 
uh, accused of being the major player in ivory uh, smuggling in uh, Africa. Um, uh, Tanzanians being a rather cynical lot when it comes to uh, thinking about their own police and security forces, uh, usually react to this sort of news by saying, well, who did she forget to pay off? Because generally the speaking, it's assumed that uh, the uh, Chinese queen of ivory, who incidentally is still in prison in Tanzania, uh, couldn't manage all of this herself unless she was working in cooperation with local um, officials. So. Um, outsiders, as traders, as financiers of this kind of uh, trade, uh, very, very important. And yet, at the, at, in the end, the dirty work done by African people. Okay? Uh, it's African people who do the work of poaching, the, the actual killing, the slaughter of um, elephants. And, and in, fact, in fact, I do want to point, make this, this contrast here. Okay? Very easy to Picture the uh, African hunters, the African poachers who uh, kill elephants as the bad people, the bad guys in this uh, story. Okay? They do have uh, certain characteristics which, you know, in, from the standpoint of many Westerners, sort of makes them suspect. Uh, uh, they are young. They often, as I say here, you know, uh, have their hair in dreads and so forth. Uh, and you can, you can then uh, contrast the image of this young man with the young women who have been hired as game rage, rangers, I think in a park in uh, South Africa. And you notice the, the very different quality of the uh, photographic image here. Okay. So in a moment, I'll come back to the hunters. But before I do, okay, let me quickly summarize the, the history of hunting, uh, of elephant hunting in Tanzania between the 1920s, okay, when that first episode of genocide ended, and the 1980s, when the second and, and ongoing period of elephant genocide began. Okay. What went on in the, in the, in the meantime? Okay. And so from the 1930s to the 1970s, uh, so far as we can gather, and again, our information about the size of elephant populations at any given time is very uh, in, very uh, imprecise. Okay? Nevertheless, it seems that during this uh, interlude, if you will, between genocidal uh, periods, Tanzania's elephant population grew uh, substantially. Uh, this was a period when the use, the possession and use of firearms by African people was tightly controlled by the colonial government. Uh, uh, Tanzania was a British colony. Okay? Uh, so African people were not able to uh, uh, have and to use firearms. And uh, indeed, hunting big game, including elephants, really became the activity of the, the famous wealthy Western um, trophy hunters, okay? um, of whom the most famous American was, of course, the, the, the novelist uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway. And there you have it. Okay? And notice he's surrounded by the men who probably in fact, undoubtedly did almost all the work of, of catching this elephant for Hemingway. It's they that did the tracking, they that knew the habits of the elephants and their, their, uh, uh, their areas where they were likely to be, be found. Um, it, in fact, it's quite likely that uh, they were the, the marksmen that actually killed the elephant as well. But Hemingway was happy to take credit for uh, his part in this is another example of the same kind of uh, scene, another uh, big game hunter. I don't know who this was. Uh, there were a number of them in this period. Okay. So that is the, the situation from the 30s to the 70s. Okay. Restriction on African hunting and on African use of firearms. Okay. Uh, uh, as a result, it seems that uh, uh, elephant populations increase in this period. In the 1980s, there was a dramatic change, uh, a dr and from the standpoint of elephants, a dramatic change for the worse. Okay? It is in the 1980s that um, uh, Tanzania and other countries of Eastern and Southern Africa began to develop their mo the modern kind of poaching that we uh, uh, are familiar with uh, now. Okay? And uh, by poaching, as you see, I, I mean uh, hunting done illegally okay, against the uh, laws of national uh, governments. Okay? Uh, 
this increase in ivory poaching took place during the very period okay, when many people in Africa, and particularly in Eastern Africa, were being made much more poor by economic policies. This was a time of, first of all, of economic crisis. Some of, I'm looking around the room and I, I realize that a few people who will remember the, uh, the lines at the gas stations in the 1970s, right? Um, this is a, uh, a, uh, a crisis that affected Africa as it did uh, the United uh, States. Okay. Uh, the oil crisis was one of the factors which plunged African countries into uh, very heavy debt by the end of the 1970s. Okay. And the result was that uh, uh, international banking organizations and Western governments got themselves together and created a program of economic recovery which uh, uh, in, in essentially imposed austerity on uh, African uh, countries. Uh, by austerity, I mean uh, African governments were forced to cut spending, especially social welfare spend spending, spending for health care and education in particular, so that they could pay back um, uh, loans. Okay? Um, at the same time, okay, this was this period of the 1980s when these new, new economic policies were introduced was a time of great confidence in what we now think of as liberal or neoliberal economic policies. Okay. The idea, as, as it was then espoused by President Reagan in this country and by the uh, Prime Minister of Britain, Margaret Thatcher, the idea was that people ought to be freed from regulation, that markets, markets ought to, uh, the government should get out of the economy and allow people to do everything for themselves. Okay. And uh, this kind of policy was applied in uh, uh, Africa as it was in the Western nations. Okay. The result of this okay, is not only increased poverty, but a situation in which uh, because uh, governments are no longer providing employment, they're no longer uh, st uh, stimulating and uh, uh, supporting agricultural markets and so forth, people find themselves in a situation of great vulnerability. As I say here, they are basically left to fend for themselves. You see? Okay? Um, they find that their, their farming income is declining, they can't get jobs, they're wage paying jobs and so forth, and what are they to do? Okay? And that, I believe, uh, goes a long way to explaining why there is an upsurge in uh, elephant poaching beginning in the 1980s. Okay? People are looking for uh, all kinds of options. Okay? Well, okay, the remainder of the talk here uh, th th this evening will be about the hunters themselves. What I've tried to do up to this point is to give you a kind of survey. Okay? We can see now that the, uh, so far as we understand it, the history, the population of history, uh, population history of Eastern African elephants, okay, is marked by uh, a first period of genocide from about 1870 to 1920, okay. We then have an interlude from about the 1930s to the 1970s when there is less hunting and elephant populations seem to recover. And then beginning in the 1980s, we once again have a period of heavy uh, elephant mortality. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm going to take one second here to uh, have something to drink. So <coughs> what I want to do, I want to try to historicize those guys, the bad guys. Okay? <coughs> I want to try to historicize you know, these young men, these desperate young men uh, who look so evil. In, uh, in these pictures. And I'm wondering if uh, history can give us a slightly different perspective on them. <coughs> okay. So what do we know about hunters, African hunters who were involved in the first genocide of elephants from 1870 to 1920? Turns out we know a fair amount from a variety of different kinds of historical sources. We know that they were virtually all male. Okay, I've never come across a reference to a woman hunter, okay, certainly not an elephant hunter. They were male, they were young. Okay? They were recognized 
in their own communities as highly skilled specialists. And indeed, if you go down to my bottom uh, bullet point there, okay, the, the word that they were referred to in the Kiswahili language, which is the national language of Tanzania now, okay, fundi, okay, that word is this very same word that is applied today to the person who fixes your automobile or maybe the, the uh, specialist who fixes your air conditioner. See, it was the very same idea of hunters as, as highly skilled uh, crafts people, okay? And their skill was, it lay in the ability to close within a very short distance of elephant, okay? Because in this period, so far as we know, most hunters operated not with firearms, but with uh, poison-tipped arrows. Okay, so they came very close within yards of elephants and, uh, and you know, managed to uh, uh, kill them at, uh, at close range. This is highly skilled and very dangerous um, work, as you can well imagine. Well, here's a picture of uh, uh, an elephant hunter who became a chief in eastern Tanzania in the 1880s. And if you look right at the top of that column of, uh, it's in French, of course, that column of text on the left-hand side, you see the same word. Fundi, okay, and uh, the uh, text in French then goes on to describe the way that these fundis were highly specialized as hunters. They didn't farm, they didn't do anything else. Uh, they thought all of that was beneath them. They were, in, they were um, you know, high status, uh, 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 high status specialists. Okay. They were mobile, okay. Uh, hunters operated over large areas moving from place to place. And the way that this worked is they would move from territory to territory, basically from one, one chiefdom to another. And when they got to a particular chiefdom, okay, they would negotiate with the leader of the place okay, and obtain permission to, to conduct hunting in this area. Okay. The payoff of a chief, and you see this in oh, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of historical uh, sources. The payoff was that the chief would get one tusk, okay, and the hunter would keep one tusk. And so an alliance then grows up between uh, political leaders, the chiefs, and the hunters uh, themselves. Here you can see a picture of some of the implements uh, that were used both by hunters and by chiefs. This is from the 1880s again in East Africa. Okay. And here's a picture, okay, one of the very few pictures, in fact, the only one I've really been able to find from this um, period. And these, you know, these guys had real swagger. There's no doubt about it, okay. Uh, they were, you know, as I say here, uh, alpha males, okay. They were glamorous guys. Um, and I don't know if you can see that, you know, by, by looking at the uh, picture, but written descriptions of them, you know, convey that sense uh, all the time. When they showed up in a village or a chiefdom, people took note. They had a certain kind of awe <coughs> about them. Okay? Um, and uh, so here's an example of, these, of, a, of two of these guys with swagger. Okay? Now, here I'm going to talk for a minute about a certain kind of historical um, uh, evidence, if you will, that is very unusual. This is evidence that has been uh, created by a historian who was a specialist in the history of African languages. Okay? And what she does, is her name is uh, Catherine de Lunar, as you can see here. What she does is she, um, she com among other things, she compares uh, words that are etymologically related. Now, that's a, that's a mouthful, right? Etymology has to do with the origin of words. Think, for example, I was thinking about this the other day. I was trying to think of a good example. Maybe this one will help. There's a whole bunch of words in English that all derive from the same Latin source, and the word for year. Anybody know what the word for year is in Latin? Um. Yeah, ani. I think that's, that's the plural, I think, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, 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 anus as well, as well, I think. As, I think is a singular. Can you think of any words that are... Um, uh, that might come from that Latin word? Anniversary. Anniversary, that's one. Annual. Say, say again? Annual. Annual, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a ton of them, it turns out. I looked, I, looked, I looked this one up. Annuity, right? Did anybody say anniversary? Anniversary.
is another one. But also words like millennial, okay, and decennial and millennium all derive from the same ancestor word. They all have the same ancestry, okay? And what the Luna does is to, you know, look very carefully at these, this cluster of words that share common ancestry, and she teases out of them the, the, the relationship between the different words, how the different words convey meanings that are different, but nevertheless associated with each other. You see what I'm saying? Yeah? And so, she's shown us, for example, by looking at, the, at words from languages that are spoken in, in uh, Zambia, Okay, that uh, you, you can see a relationship between, first of all, the word for hunter and the word for wind and breath. And how do I say it? The whooshing sound okay, that's made when a spear is thrown or when an uh, a arrow is fired with a bow. Anybody, anybody expert here in bows and arrows or spears? Uh, I, bet there's, I bet there's a hunter or two here, but you just won't, won't admit it. Okay, um, I actually looked this up on the internet as well. On the internet, there's actually, there are elaborate conversations about how different kinds of arrows, for example, make different sounds in flight. Okay? And African languages had words for these different sounds. You know, in order to understand this too, you have to realize we're talking about a pre-industrial setting. There, is, there are no cars thundering along on I-80, okay? There's no background noise at all except for, you know, birds chirping. And in that kind of very quiet kind of situation, people become extremely sensitive to different sounds. Even, you know, that faint sound of the arrow in the air, okay? And that, that's where this kind of word comes from, okay? And so now, you know, you begin to think about this. Why is it that a hunter would be so concerned about wind? Why would, why would wind be so closely associated with hunters? Huh? Ah, uh, that, yeah, that's probably, probably true. Probably, I, I guess. I, I'm, I don't have never done any of this myself, but uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Okay, that could, that's one possibility. Anything else? Can you think of anything else? Rain, rain. Say again? I mean, bring rain into your land. Well, rain? Yeah, yeah. Sure, could be, could be. But that's still not the most direct con connection. Yes, because the wind can carry your scent, right? Okay, yes, exactly right. And sound as well. That's right. So one of the attributes of these highly skilled fundies, these very, very uh, uh, expert craftspeople or specialists, was the ability to use magic in order to control the winds. Okay, so that the wind, which, so you, what you want, you want the wind behind your prey, right? You want the wind blowing towards you. That's, that's, the, that's the relationship you want to maintain with the wind. And you don't want blustery conditions, you don't want a situation where the direction of the wind is moving around wildly, you know? So the, the ability to control of that, control that is, a, is attributed then to uh, hunters, okay? And uh, likewise, the dying breath, Kate Luna suggests. The, the, the idea of a breath has to do with how, you know, the sound of an animal gasping for breath as he, as he or she is just about to die. That this would have been one of the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a signal of the hunter's success. Right? This hunter has succeeded in killing uh, his prey. Okay? So again, breath associated with hunting as well. And finally, and this is the kind of the clincher for what I want to talk about, is that the Luna tells us that another word also derived from the same ancestor source as the word for hunter, the word for breath, the word for wind, is a word that denotes a particular kind of male fame a kind of famousness okay, that is uh, achieved by men, different from famousness that might be achieved by women. Okay? Um, and so these, uh, what, what this gets at then is that this fame, this fame is, is, is obtained by being really good at hunting, by catching the prey, okay, by, and you catch the prey because you can master the winds so you won't allow the prey to uh, scent you, 
or to hear you. You can then close, you know, you, you crawl through the bushes and so forth. You close very, very close to um, the elephant. And then finally, here I use the example of the spear, but the same thing holds for uh, poison-tipped elephants. Okay? The, the, uh, the hunter uses his tremendous skill with these weapons in order to uh, land a deadly sh shot. I'm not sure where, uh, but uh, more probably in the neck of the uh, elephant. Okay. Now let me tell you a little bit about how all of this looks from, our, from the standpoint of oral traditions okay, that are told and preserved, told generation after generation by um, African people. Okay. Um, here again, the idea of masculine fame uh, is very important, uh, but it comes up in a slightly different way. And I'm going to talk for a second about oral traditions that come from two different parts of uh, Tanzania. One is up there, if you can see, a, pla a place called Samba, and another one here, the land of the Hehe people. Okay? In both of those areas, I've heard uh, oral traditions okay, that run like this. Okay? What they say is that in, in these societies, new and more sophisticated forms of political institutions emerged as a result of the encounter of hunters with people, usually women, living in villages. Okay? So what you have is a situation in these stories where the hunters are out in the bush, they're out in the forest, they're wandering around on, on their own, up and down, up, uphill, down dale, and so forth. Right? And eventually they come to a village, and they come to a village most often where there are no men at all, very often only sisters. Okay? And uh, what happens is, uh, as you might expect, the hunter eventually becomes interested in at least one of the sisters, and uh, he decides to uh, settle down there. Okay? And uh, in so doing, he establishes a new, he has children with his new wife, and they are establishing a new kind of uh, royal dynasty. Okay? But as I say right at the bottom of this slide, okay, what you're seeing here is a kind of a process of socialization, okay? a process of, and African people talk about it in precisely these terms, a process of becoming civilized. Okay? But it's a process that has to involve women, okay? a process which uh, uh, at every turn involves, as I say here, you know, the agreement and the, the guidance of women, women who are teaching these men, these men who have come from the, from the bush, come from the forest, how to behave in polite society, if you will. Okay? Here's uh, another story, and I'm going to tell you now that this is uh, as close as you're ever going to get in a lecture by a historian to true breaking news. Okay, because this is a story that uh, comes from a dissertation uh, which uh, was defended successfully only yesterday by one of my own PhD students. And, uh, I think somebody's sending uh, a message about this to that person right at the, right at the moment here. Um, so the story is from Zimbabwe, not from Tanzania, but it's essentially the same kind of story. Okay? So long ago, there's, there's this area called Bocha. And in this Bocha area, there was an impenetrable, impenetrable forest. And in fact, uh, the author, Aldrin Magaya, explained, explained to us all only yesterday in the defense that this area had a very large population of elephants. He concealed that from me up until then. Okay? And so a couple of famous elephants go there. I'm sorry, famous elephant hunters go there, Mutsago and Ruswa. Okay? And they ask the ruler of the area for permission to hunt there. And you know, just like I've already explained, they, uh, uh, they get their permission and they start hunting. Here's an artist's depiction of this kind of encounter. Okay? The hunters coming in from the forest, showing up unexpectedly in the settlement of people living in a village, sort of uh, um, uh, politely probably asking for a meal. Okay? Um, so anyway. The story runs that these hunters, and you, ha and you have to keep in mind now, these guys are real mountain men. 
you know, in the sense that uh, they aren't gonna they aren't gonna live like everybody else. They, they these are these are like cowboys on the range. You know, they they're not going to abide by the conventions of of normal society. So when they're invited to sleep in in the houses in the village, they say, Oh no, no, no we can't do that. We're hunters. We're too you know we're too rough and gruff for for, for houses. We have to stay outside. And so they stay outside under the stars. And uh, uh, but there's the problem of the lions. There are a lot of lions lurking around the village. And so they use a medicine of their own to sprinkle around the perimeter of their campsite. And in this way, they keep the lions away. So the next morning, the next morning, the chief gets up. That's the, the, uh, the chief that they'd negotiated with him. And they, they assume that you know, he's going to wake up, that he's going to get up, and he's going to see that the hunters have been killed and, and ripped to shreds you know, by the lions. Well, not so. They're still alive, and they're still doing very well. He's amazed at the prowess and ability of these people, and he decides to arrange a marriage between one of the hunters and one of his own uh, daughters. And this is the story of how the ruling dynasty of this particular part of Zimbabwe is uh, created. Okay, But what I, what I want to point to, I emphasize here, is to go back to the line about this. And, I, and, I, and if I haven't said this already, I should have explained that what we have here is a quote from uh, a storyteller in Zimbabwe. Okay? This is the, these are the words of the storyteller as collected by my student. And you notice at the end of this slide, uh, the storyteller saying, the hunters didn't sleep in houses. Okay? Now, one of the ways that African oral traditions often work okay, is that they leave spaces, spaces for the listeners to fill in the meaning. Okay? Kind of an ellipsis, if you will, you know, where uh, things aren't said explicitly, but you as the listener you know, <laughs> fill in the blanks. Okay? So these mountain men guys, they wouldn't sleep in the house, would they? But after, you know, uh, after they're given one of the, the daughters, they, they, they make, they make a mar one of them makes a marriage with one of the chief's daughters. Okay? Now at that point, any Zimbabwean listener to the story realizes okay, that the wife is going to have to teach this mountain man guy how to live in a house, okay? how to eat good cooked food, how to live in a house, probably how to uh, shave his beard. Um, in other words, how to be uh, civilized. Okay? You don't have to say that to an audience, of, peop well, to an audience of, of people in Zimbabwe because people already know okay, that Respect, respectably married couples okay, can only conduct their married life in a, in a house. Right? The only people who would go outside of the house, only couples that would hide themselves in the cornfield are either um, adulterers okay, or desperate teenagers. Okay? And by definition, both of them are you know, transgressors of um, you know, the norms of respectable adult behavior. So again, what you're seeing is that the marriage, it becomes a way in which the wife is sort of, you know, um, guiding the, this, this rough man to uh, a point where he becomes a respectable and productive uh, member of uh, society. Okay. Um, he, in fact, uh, uh, what I, th I think one way to th understand this is that the skills, the skills of the hunter are only socially useful okay, when they're valorized by women. You see what I'm saying? That only when you have a relationship with a woman, woman that involves having children, building a household and family and so forth, only then do your abilities as a hunter really serve a social purpose. Okay? And so hunters can't really be uh, productive members of society without um, this connection with, uh, with women. Okay? So that's um, the way that we understand uh, hunting from the uh, oral traditions. And again, just to emphasize, okay, what the, the major point here, okay, is that hunters 
okay, only important, only valorized when they have relationships with women. Now, okay, we come to a very different kind of view of hunters in the early colonial period. Okay, and let me just say that um, uh, European colonialism began in Tanzania, Tanzania in 1889. Okay, and this period of German rule, the Germans were the first Europeans to rule this part of Africa. Uh, this story of uh, the German period in Tanzania has recently been um, uh, examined anew by a historian named Gassibel. Okay? Um, <clears throat> he actually shows us that in the colonial period, the period when Tanzania is ruled uh, for the first time by Europeans, that hunters play two kinds of roles. On the one hand, they lead rebellion. Okay? Hunters were very much affected by early colonial rule because uh, colonial governments restricted their, their, their right to rule. It took away from them their right to own firearms and other kinds of weapons and so forth. Okay? As a result, hunters were very important as leaders in one of the most famous conflicts in East African history, the famous Maji Maji War, which began in 1905, a war of African people against the German colonial state. Okay? And as I say, hunters uh, play a crucial role in that war. Okay? But the historian de Sibyl talks about a second kind of venue or role exercised by African hunters under early colonial um, authority. Okay? His key term in explaining his argument is the idea of middle ground. He believes that African hunters and um, German military commanders come together, okay, come together to cooperate in the hunt. They hunt together. And it's that, he, when he's say, talking about middle ground, he's not so much talking about a specific space. He's talking about a specific context in which certain activities take place. Those activities are uh, cooperation, White hunters, African hunters are joining together to become more successful hunters. Gassibel shows us that uh, the German hunters appreciate their African counterparts for their skills, particularly in tracking, and not to mention their great sensitivity for the winds and for faint sounds and all of that kind of thing. On the other side, the African hunters admire the weapons, the modern firearms of uh, the German hunters. And interestingly enough, the historian Gassibel tells us that on both sides, hunting sort of affirms a sense of masculinity. Okay? Both African societies and German society, says the historian, share the same you know, um, uh, characteristic uh, uh, whereby uh, men, men become known for, they become famous, they become known for their physical uh, strength and their skills and so forth by virtue of their skills in hunting. Hunting a sign of virility and masculinity. Okay? So this is the colonial middle ground. What is missing from Gossibel's point, and it's not, it, I'm not blaming him for this because this is the way it was, there are no women on this middle ground, you see? Uh, uh, whereas hunter, women turn out to play a crucial role in the lives of hunters in African oral tradition, under colonial rule, women disappear from the story of hunting. Whereas earlier, in the oral traditions of my student and the others, okay, it's women who valorize the work of hunters. Now, okay, the, the, the skills of African hunters are being valorized by what? Other men, right? Women are disappearing from the scene, okay? Well, this gets me into a theme that is way too broad to be able to talk about tonight, but let me just say very quickly that what this is is a kind of small example of a much bigger thing that happened as Africa was dominated by European colonialism. Women were subordinated in many different ways. Okay? Their work, their labor, their skills, all devalued. Okay? Men given much more value than women. Okay? Um, 
And we can see this uh, uh, borne out very uh, clearly in the example from this particular historian. Okay? So here's the, here's the middle ground. Okay? Notice the white hunter with his African uh, partners, uh, in this case, ze killing zebras. Well, okay, what I want to use is a, I want to keep in mind that kind of transition from a situation where women valorized hunters to a situation where other men valorized hunters. Okay? Uh, keep in mind that and the general subordination of women as we come to the last issue that I want to talk about. And that is the connection between poverty and poaching during the ongoing period of elephant genocide. Remember, I said that this uh, this period of genocide began in the 1980s. It continues down to the present. This is, in fact, a period when poverty, especially in the rural parts of Tanzania, in its villages, its countryside, where poverty has, in many respects, increased. But the point that I want you to keep in mind about poverty here okay, is that in many meaningful ways, poverty is a relative condition. It's not so much about whether your condition, your own situation changes in absolute terms. It's got a lot more to do with whether your situation's changing in relation to other people. Okay? If you suddenly see everybody around you seeming to be much better off, they're all buying new cars or whatever, right? and you can't afford to, okay? you begin to think of yourself as worse off. You begin to think of yourself as poor. Okay? And I would argue that since the 1980s, Rural Tanzania, the Tanzania of the villages, has experienced a sense that they are getting poorer, that they are losing ground by virtue of people who, by Tanzanians who live in the cities. Okay? Uh, as I say uh, in point number two, rural Tanzanians become poor compared to city Tanzania. And at the same time, rural Tanzanians uh, experience disadvantage in terms of access to education. And that's made it more difficult for them to catch up with the city people, who in fact have better access to education. Here are just some, some points that I, I draw out of a recent document on poverty in, uh, in Tanzania. Notice in the second paragraph, poverty particularly pervasive according to the World Bank in rural areas, about 70% of the population in, of the villages estimated to be living in poverty according to the World Bank, uh, and a large share of population hovering around the poverty line. Other research by the World Bank speaks of 80% of uh, the poor living in uh, rural areas. It speaks about inequality between cities and rural areas. Okay. It talks about how poverty is negatively uh, correlated with levels of education. In other words, the less education you have, the poorer you're likely to be. Okay. Also, um, uh, way, this is worth keeping in mind, wage employment and non-farm businesses associated with lower poverty. Now, this is important when it comes to poaching because what, what those terms really mean are uh, people are less poor in the countryside when they have alternative ways of earning money, not just by farming, but by doing other things as well. And what, uh, one, what is one of the other things that they might do? Poaching. Exactly. That's exactly right. Of course. And, and we don't need to go through all of this in great detail. Uh, the contrast, if you, look, if you want to look at this uh, uh, PowerPoint for yourself, the thing, to keep, the thing to notice is the difference between the rural category and Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam is the biggest city in Tanzania. Uh, when people think of the difference between themselves and city folk, they think about Dar es Salaam. And you can see that uh, uh, indicators of poverty are dramatically different when you compare villagers and people in Dar es Salaam. Okay? Uh, this is, this uh, graphic simply I, I include to give you a sense of what it means to be poor. Okay? Uh, when, you, when you feel that you're poor, you uh, eat food that you like less often. Okay? You limit the variety of your foods. You basically eat the same thing every day. And then when you can't afford to eat three times a, a day uh, anymore, you reduce the number of meals 
per day. This evidence suggesting to us that approximately one-fifth of Tanzania's uh, population uh, has re reduced its number of meals. My guess would be that figure is probably over 50 percent in many places that I've been to in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, this graphic here, simply to show that uh, when you compare urban people and rural people, uh, rural people are much less likely to go to school and therefore much less likely to be able to escape uh, poverty. And this graphic says pretty much the same thing. And, um, again, the probability of completing primary school is much higher in urban areas. Okay? If you're a student in an urban primary school, you're much more likely to finish school than your village cousin. Okay? And your chances of going to secondary school and uh, university are much greater if you live in the city. The chances of getting all the way to university from a village in Tanzania is pretty remote these days. And, and now I want to finish very quickly okay, by uh, pointing to some evidence from this particular location in Tanzania from the Ruaha National Park, right down in the south uh, central part of Tanzania. Absolutely, it's not one, of, not one of Tanzania's most famous parks. It's absolutely gorgeous. I uh, last went there with a group of uh, UI students on a study abroad uh, trip, and we, we had a great time. And this, this is a picture of the elephants in uh, the Ruaha Park. Okay. Um, so there's been a recent uh, uh, scholarly publication, this is it, okay, about the conditions or villages outside, around, surrounding the Ruaha Park. Many of those villages are known, notorious, as sites of uh, poaching. Okay? Again, I want to uh, insist on the point that poverty is experienced as a relative condition. Okay? Um, but what I want to suggest to you now is that your feelings of being poor okay, can, be in, can be mixed up with um, the, the uh, relationship between uh, genders or, or your gender identity. Okay? And um, the, at the bottom of the screen, I um, quote from the article on the next uh, screen. Notice that the authors of that article uh, conclude this. They say, poverty is a complex condition. They say, how a poacher views his household affects his po poaching. Those who consider themselves to be poor are likely to poach more intensively. So the, their finding in these villages outside of the Ruaha Park was that the, the poorer you feel, the more poaching you're going to do. Okay? Well, many, by now, there are many scholarly studies that have drawn the link between poverty in villages and poaching. So that's not anything new. What I want to try to get across to you, though, is the idea that I think the sense of being poor is very much affected by gender. Okay? Uh, today, today um, it's extremely difficult for young men, poor young men living in villages, young men who have very little education, okay, to be able to establish a family, to be able to uh, marry, to be able to do the, make the kind of contributions to community and social life that are expected of men. In other words, they can't really achieve, they can't fulfill their sense of masculinity, what a, what a man ought to be. Okay? And I think that lies, and I, incidentally, I base this now uh, on more or less anecdotal evidence, that is, having listened to an awful lot of conversations in these kind of communities over the years, I think that um, this sense of failure to, you know, the failure to be a productive man is very much what drives uh, these desperate young men into uh, uh, poaching. Okay? In other words, they gain the kind of valorization from uh, women that their uh, grandfathers and great-grandfathers were able uh, to uh, achieve. And the result is that you know, they feel uh, poor, they feel uh, without you know, options and so forth. They're willing, as a result, to try almost any kind of thing to make uh, money. Okay? Well, I'll stop there then. That's plenty, you've heard plenty from me. Okay. <clears throat>
Let me invite questions from the audience. Well, I'd be really disappointed if nobody's got a question because Professor Heinemann said how lively you've been. <laughs> Have I really killed the audience here? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Huh? Here we go. Kill your soul. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> let, you me know, bring, let me bring the mic a, around. This is a very upsetting thing, um, uh, you know, for, for many of us who, uh, and I've been going to Tanzania for 30 years, to, to, to see this kind of devastation, uh, you know, in these, in these species is, is devastating. At the same time, though, talking to poor people, some of whom probably are poachers themselves, you also can't um, not have, uh, you know, uh, sympathy for the kind of conditions under which they live as well. Um, I was just wondering, do you speak Swahili? Yeah, I do. Do you? No, okay. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. And most of, most of the interview work that I do in Tanzania, in fact, all of it is in, is in Swahili. Uh, there's very little English spoken in, in uh, village Tanzania, actually. Yes? So are there any places where there can be hunting of elephants or other game that aren't protected or elephants all protected? You know, um, obviously there is hunting that goes on around the world that is yeah. essentially protected hunting yeah. and it's some hunting that's even necessary of things like, you know, overpopulation of game and things like that. Like we have here in Iowa with deer. Right. Um, right. Now, clearly elephants aren't suffering that that <laughs> overpopulation problem, but is there a thing like that that's available where they don't have to hunt protected elephants? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, is that even a thing? Yeah, that's a great question. That's, that's a point I can, I, I can very usefully try to clarify here, because I, did, I didn't mention that. I'll begin with a, uh, uh, a story, brief story. Okay. Uh, a number of years ago, when the second George Bush was, was still president, okay, we went to a, a, a village in southern Tanzania, and uh, my wife and I, and we went into a shop, okay? And in the shop, there was a picture of um, the, then the incumbent George Bush, as well as his father, okay? So we saw these pictures, they're very nice pictures framed and everything, very unusual thing to see, see in Tanzania. So we asked, well, how come those pictures of our American president? And they said, well, they come to hunt. They come here to hunt, okay? And it turned out they did. They, they came to that very place in Tanzania to hunt. Now, they were not poaching. Okay, the bushes were not poaching. Uh, they were engaged in uh, legal hunting. You can, uh, at, at great cost, this is a rich man's, a rich person's uh, uh, kind of sport, you can, in fact, you know, buy a license to hunt elephants and other species, rhinos as well. And uh, uh, access to those uh, licenses is uh, limited in order to, uh, you know, uh, protect the damage or limit the damage done to uh, uh, elephant pot populations. So yes, that's the answer. There is a, a whole dip parallel world of legal hunting by Western sports people. But only for Westerners, not for Africans. Well, I mean, very few Tanzanians can afford this stuff. I, I'm sure there are. In the, other, the other area where uh, uh, hunters come from these days is the Middle, the Middle East. Okay. Um, and there's, been, in fact, at times been controversy in Tanzania, particularly when a very large tract of land was set aside for uh, hunters from a, a one particular Middle Eastern um, country. Uh, <clears throat> it was assumed that this, the government had done this because there had been a good deal under the table uh, exchange of money. Okay. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the, that's the situation. Uh, Thank you. What, what is the, the state of uh, world relief organizations in attempting to diversify the economy in these uh, areas? Oh, there's a good deal of that. There's a good deal of that. There are a lot of organizations. Um, uh, most of this work being done, as, as I think you're suggesting, by uh, uh, Western organizations that uh, uh, try to establish a variety of different sorts of projects the primary purpose of these projects is to provide alternative um, ways of making money so that people won't uh, be forced by virtue of their desperation uh, and lack of income into uh, poaching. Uh, my sense of this is that these kind of projects have a kind of, they aren't entirely successful. Um, sometimes because the projects try to uh, establish 
activities which really don't provide very much income. That, that's, a, that's a serious problem. And sometimes, uh, for example, projects that um, try to set up farming projects as an alternative to poaching run into the problem of poor transport infrastructure. You know, you can't earn money by growing crops for sale unless you have a way of transporting your crops to um, a market. And if roads are really bad, there aren't enough vehicles and so forth, uh, that, that constitutes a tremendous barrier. So there's lots of efforts, I would say, you know, the, the, the actual results are spotty. Uh. Um, would you say that with the poaching license that are sold to yeah. rich people, huh? um, is that money being maybe used wisely on infrastructure or fixing up the welfare programs that were cut for education? Oh, programs? boy, that's a great question. That's a great question. Do you remember right at the beginning I showed a clip from the newspaper, right, about uh, the U.S. government um, uh, permitting the importation of trophies, ivory trophies, into the U.S. once again. Now, the argument that stands behind that uh, move was that um, encouraging more sport hunting, and by, by this, of course, I mean not the poaching that I was describing, but the sport hunting by the rich men and women, okay, that this would, in fact, uh, lead to more income for conservationist uh, organizations and government agencies, the government agencies that are uh, responsible for protecting elephants. And one of the direct ways it was hoped in which uh, this income would be used would be to actually f uh, pay for the game wardens, okay? You know, to actually uh, set up a, f a larger, increase the s size of the uh, force of game uh, wardens. Well, that's, that's the intention. Whether, um, whether, in fact, it works out that way uh, is very complicated, uh, in large part because uh, very often uh, funds of this sort tend to be siphoned off in various ways by um, various actors within, uh, within government. And so the, by and large, conservationist um, activists okay, uh, have objected to this decision by the Trump administration on the grounds that it's only going to encourage more hunting okay, and at the same time won't succeed in actually uh, getting money to the agencies that really uh, would be effective in protecting elephants. Oh, come on. I wonder question. if I Maybe can ask a question. Good. I have a question. Oh, hey. we have one at the front. Hey. I'll save my, we actually have two more here. Great. Well, I was just going to ask if there's anything that just like a normal person could do to help. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, there are various organizations that um, I think play a, a constructive role. Um, and uh, many of those organiza organizations, probably all of them, are looking for donations. They might in, at times actually be looking for uh, volunteers uh, as well. Uh, on the other hand, though, uh, you know, what we're talking about is a huge global problem. We're talking, of, ultimately, we're talking about a situation uh, created by the vast inequalities by the more wealthy parts of the world, those parts of the world that can afford to import expensive things like ivory, and, you know, the very poor parts of the world, Tanzania. East Africa, Southern Africa, where people are desperate for even, you know, enough money to eat three meals a day. Um, how it is that we can affect that global situation is a, is a very difficult um, question. But, uh, you know, there are uh, organizations, non-governmental organizations in particular, that, um, you know, do play a, a constructive role, the World Wildlife Fund, for, for example. Yeah. We had a question up front. Have you ever seen a live elephant carcass before? And if so, how did it make you feel? Because in my family, my mother has several elephant tattoos, and she told me the meanings behind loyal, strong, loving, caring. Uh -huh. And it's been told that elephants have such caring that when a mate of theirs dies, they end up dying because they won't eat or anything because they're such loving animals. So it kind of destroys me inside to see people do this to a caring animal. So if you've seen this, how would you describe it? 
course, I've never seen an elephant talk. So I've never seen the kind of scene that you're, you're, you're suggesting. Okay. It must be horrific. I mean, you saw the picture. Um, uh, one of those pictures is quite enough for, for, one, for one evening. Um, it's, also, it's also very difficult to see people living in you know, deep poverty and to see what the lack of hope for the future does to people, the frustration experienced by young people, and you know, how that kind of eats away at people. Today in Tanzania, Okay. You know, I was describing earlier that how in the 1980s that Africa began to develop a more so-called liberalized, it's not the same as liberal, but liberalized uh, economy, which sort of put people on their own to sort of fend for themselves. And today, that process has, has advanced much further. And if you talk to many people today, you know, you just have conversations with them, or, you know, over drinks or over dinner or something like that, over and over again, you hear the same thing. People say, we've lost our sense of humanity. Okay? The word in Swahili is utu. It means humanity. A person, really, yeah, humanity is the best, best definition. And people say that over and over again. Okay? And many Tanzanians would put the activities of the poachers in that uh, um, frame. That is to say, you know, many of the many most I think most people in Tanzania, you know, have that same kind of sense of respect for these uh, magnificent species that you have. Okay, that they attribute to them many of the same uh, characteristics that you just uh, mentioned. I mean, you can't look at you know, it's really hard to look at them without feeling some of that. I, don't, I, I hope I didn't come across as scoffing at those ideas. It, it just comes naturally to you when you actually see how uh, uh, dignified these animals actually are. African people are very much affected by that as well. Okay? And so they too, just like us, they say to themselves, what can it be that drives our young people to do stuff like this? You know, What are the forces at work okay, that are destroying humanity in our community, in our, in our nation, you know? And that's, um, you know, the, 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 so, so, so this becomes, you know, one of the ways in which they, they see, um, you know, fundamental hu humanity just disappearing. I know it's not, this doesn't exactly answer your question, but yeah, I do want you to come away realizing that, you know, the overwhelmingly African people share very much the same perception that you do. You know, and, and I'll just add to that one thing. In rural Tanzania, in rural Africa, you remember, elephants are a great pest because they destroy crops. And you only have to have an elephant in a cornfield for about three minutes before your whole crop is gone. I mean, they're huge, right? But that doesn't mean people are going to want to kill them. They want to scare them off, but they don't want to kill them. You know? uh, there's a, there, and, and so today, people ask themselves, why is it that that, that respect for we, that we have for these, these beings is uh, being destroyed. Yes. How much of the answer do you believe lies in uh, developing uh, non-hunting uh, safari tourism? Uh, non-hunting tourism. Yeah. You know, honestly, I don't think very much because th my guess is that uh, non-hunting tourism probably doesn't attract the kind of people that are, you know, actually uh, taking gun in hand to uh, engage in, in uh, sport uh, hunting. Uh, I just think it, 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 it's a different uh, clientele, to tell you the truth. Um, I mean, because I, 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 otherwise, I can't understand it, really. I can't really understand why people uh, kill uh, uh, these, these animals. If you want to see them in the wild, and it's an amazing experience, uh, you can, you know, all sorts of opportunities to do the photographic uh, safaris, the non-hunting. Uh, so, so, very, so I asked myself, well, why, why isn't that enough? You know? But I, I could be wrong about that, but that's my instinct. So I recently recalled that many American diamond companies are rather furious that Chinese companies are flooding the market with synthetic diamonds, uh -huh. which are almost completely indistinguishable. And they're trying to fuel efforts to try and figure out how to determine which, whether or not the di like how to determine whether a diamond is real mm -hmm. or synthetic. So I, I was wondering, like, 
why haven't uh, attempts to create maybe synthetic ivory to attack the demand of ivory and perhaps maybe like education over, because if I, I recall correctly, most of ivory goes to like Chinese traditional medicine, which right. is mostly just bunk. So why haven't like uh, attempts to educate people on that kind of like demand and reduce demand gone on? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll give you one, one answer to this, okay? And the answer is the word aphrodisiac, okay? That's one of the primary uses, as I understand it, of ivory. It is understood to be a medicinal, a medicine, okay? And to have the ability to um, uh, revive the uh, love life of uh, older men in particular. Okay, you can't replace that. For people who believe that, 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 that ivory really has that characteristic, you can't replace it. Okay? You can use synthetic ivory to create works of art, for example, but as a medicine, you, there, there is no substitute. So I, I mean, I, I think that actually is part of, the, uh, part of the answer. There are people who will pay anything to obtain this kind of um, medicine. You know? So it's, I think it's, it's always, there's always going to be a demand uh, there uh, for it. Or maybe you don't agree, but... Well, I mean, yeah. I was thinking, like, if you flooded the mark with something that was indistinguishable, right. then, right. like, how would they know the difference? Well, I don't know if it, if, if it really is indistinguishable, because it's, surely uh, someone would do a chemical analysis and figure out this is, this is different, right? And that, or not. I mean, I think that there's a, see, what I'm getting at, there is a real, for, pe for people who pay the most money for ivory, you know, and who want, wish to use it and as a love medicine, uh, there's a real inducement to make sure that you're getting the real stuff. Yeah. So I think it's a difficult thing. Um, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One from that, um, it, on, on the idea of making synthetic ivory, yeah. um, do you think that it could possibly be done with like elephant stem cells? Um, like would that, it didn't come from a live elephant, but it would technically still be the same thing. Do you think that sort of thing could replace that right, right, trade? Right. Um, and then that was maybe a little more rhetorical of a question, but um, the my other question was, you mentioned that the money from the uh, rich hunters is going towards trying to help the conservationists mm -hmm. and the government efforts to conserve and prevent poaching in that way, but wouldn't it make more sense for that money to go to creating jobs for the people that are committing the poaching um, and sort of prevent the poaching by giving the people something else to do? I like that idea. I like that idea. I think that's a very, very interesting idea. On your first point, I'm a historian. I can't say. I, I don't know. And in fact, uh, going back to this gentleman's uh, uh, question as well, I don't really know enough about what drives demand for ivory, whether it be in China or anywhere else. Uh, I've never been there. I haven't seen how ivory is used. Uh, if this is really beyond my uh, e expertise. Um, uh, and and, and uh, uh, likewise, your idea about uh, uh, using stem cells sounds really fascinating as, as well, but I, I couldn't say. Uh, on the second point, I think you're, you, you're getting to something about the idea of encouraging more uh, employment. I think if people had more income, okay, they would be much less likely to undertake um, uh, an activity like poaching, which after all is highly dangerous. It's not so dangerous because the elephants will attack you. It's because there are competing poachers out there and there are heavily armed uh, soldiers and game wardens as well. This is no child's play. And I think if, uh, in, in many cases, if people uh, were not quite so desperate, they had alternative uh, ways of, of making a money income, they would uh, prefer that instead. So I think you're onto something. So obviously it's very horrendous when they poach and they take this ivory. What, do you know what the value is generally for a pair of tusks? Gosh, I don't know. In, in, in dollar terms, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it's, it probably wouldn't be difficult to look it up, but it's something I didn't think to look up. Though. Yeah. Do you have any idea of like what percentage of what it might be for, like, let's say they make X amount of dollars in a year, would it be like half of their yearly salary or? Oh, you mean the poachers, the poachers yeah. themselves? Um, uh, you know, it could well be that uh, they, even if they earn only a tiny fraction 
of the sale price of the ivory. That still might be a very substantial part of their annual income. Uh, you know, huge numbers of people in uh, rural Tanzania, you know, live on under $300 a day. Uh, under a dollar a day. So, you know, it doesn't take very much before you're actually, uh, you know, uh, earning in one shot a very large part of your yearly income. But I, I, I have to say I don't have the, the command of the figures. Did I see another hand? No. Well, I want to thank you very much um, okay. for really an awfully interesting lecture. Okay.